Many years ago, I remember hearing a series of talks given by the late Russian Orthodox Archbishop Antony Bloom, and in the first of them, he described how he himself had become a Christian. He was a young man in communist Russia and was a very keen, zealous communist. And one day he went to uh, some kind of a lecture or talk by somebody who was actually saying that Christianity was true and that we should take it seriously. And he went home furious about this and he was determined to disprove this Christianity nonsense once and for all. So he rummaged around until he found a Bible and he thought, well, I'll just read some of this and find out what it's really about and then I will write something which will show that it's all completely wrong. And he went to the New Testament in the Bible that he'd managed to find, and he looked through to see which was the shortest of the Gospels, thinking that he would read that one and that would be quite enough to be going on with. And so he read the Gospel of St Mark. And as he said, with a smile, that was the point, later looking back, when he realised that God had a sense of humour, because Mark's Gospel is exactly the Gospel for somebody in that frame of mind. Mark's Gospel doesn't pull any punches, doesn't mince its words, doesn't waste time going into all sorts of extraneous details. It gets straight to the point. Who is Jesus? Who is he? What's it all about? And particularly, what is the meaning of his death? And so Mark is the gospel for anyone who just wants to dive straight in, get straight to the point and get on with it. Now, as I was thinking about that story, I also thought, but Mark also does repay careful study. Yes, you can read it quickly and breathlessly like Archbishop Bloom did as a young man, because that night he read Mark and then he read it again, and then he read Matthew and Luke and John and stayed up all night, and by the next day he was a Christian. That does happen, and thank God that was the beginning of a wonderful lifetime of ministry based on the Gospels for him. But Mark does repay very careful study. When I moved to Scotland a couple of years ago, uh, I, I went with a son of mine to play at a local golf club, and I said to the man who let us on, is this a difficult course? And he looked at me and said, this is a course that rewards good golf. And I thought, oh dear, I'm going to be in trouble then. But I want to say Mark is a Gospel that rewards careful study as well as rather breathless, urgent reading. So whether you're coming to it just straight off and want to go straight through, or whether you want to sit down and chew it over line by line, this is a book for you. Mark is a bit breathless. Uh, early on in the Gospel, things seem to tumble out one after the other. Immediately Jesus did this, immediately Jesus did that. At once he went off and said this and that happened and so on. And this mirrors the central message that launches in at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, which is Jesus, after his baptism, after his time in the wilderness, coming back and saying, now is the time for God to be king. This is the time. The time is fulfilled. God's kingdom is arriving. So turn back and believe in this good news. What would people have heard when Mark was writing that book? We assume that Mark was writing probably in the late 60s of the first century, though that isn't actually as solid a date as many scholars have liked to make out. But at that time, there was so much going on in Palestine, in Galilee and in Judea, and there were so many movements of revolution and people were very confused and things seemed to be boiling up to, to fever pitch. And turning back from their way of doing things and trusting God for his kingdom in his way, this was a crucial message then as it had been when Jesus of Nazareth said it 30 years before. And we have to think our way back into their minds in order to understand this vital turning point of all history. In their minds, there would have been one particular text, a book of the Old Testament we know well, called the book of Daniel. Josephus, the great Jewish historian writing about the period when Mark was writing his gospel, says that at that time this book was driving people to revolt because they really believed that it predicted that the, at that time a world ruler would arise from Judea. And in Daniel chapter 7 verse 22, uh, the prophet says that this is about the time being fulfilled at which God's people would receive the kingdom. It looks as though Jesus and then Mark is picking up that idea. This is the time when everything from the prophecies of old is going to be fulfilled and God is going to take his power and reign in a totally new way and everything is going to be different as a result. And as you'd find if you read back through other prophetic books, Jeremiah and so on, all the way back to the end of Deuteronomy, which is also something of a prophecy, you would find that that's 
part of the key to it all that when God's people realize things have got to a terrible state and they turn back, turn away from their own ambitions and agendas and say, okay, God, we want to be your people. We want to follow your way alone. That's the time when God will say, okay, now we're in business. That's what Jesus, according to Mark, is saying. The time is fulfilled. This is the time for God to become king. So turn back from what you were doing and believe this good news instead. And everything else in Mark's gospel flows from that. And that's, of course, the challenge that we all face during Lent. Whatever's been going on, let's put it on hold. Let's just turn back. Let's stop the headlong flight into our own way of doing stuff. And let's stop and pay attention to God's way of doing stuff, God's way of running the show. But what is this way? What's that going to mean? Jesus is doing it differently. When he comes into his local town, Capernaum, having said that this is time for God to become king, he doesn't at once call an army together and say, we're going to march on Jerusalem and drive out the Romans and take it over. He's driving out something rather different, something we have problems in coming to terms with. All this stuff about evil spirits, poor demon-possessed people shrieking at him in the synagogue, and all sorts of people with malevolent intent seemingly ganging up on him. Jesus seems to be fighting a different sort of battle because the real root problem of all that has been going on that's wrong that people are vaguely aware of, has ultimately a spiritual component. And Jesus has come to deal with the problem of evil at every level, not just at the surface level that people were so aware of. So as we go through Mark, we see the positive side and the negative side of the kingdom. We see Jesus healing people. We see Jesus doing things in a new way, saying that you can't put new wine into old bottles, that everything's going to be different from now on. And so his healings, his celebrations of the kingdom with all and sundry, these are the signs of what God is up to. And the shrieking demons in the synagogue and the plotting Pharisees and Herodians who seem to be out to get him, these are the signs that something structurally is very wrong, not only out there in the wider world, as Jews of Jesus' day were well aware, but actually in here too, among the people of Israel themselves. And Mark is keen to explain right off the top that the new thing which is happening, however, is not simply an innovation saying let's forget everything that's gone before because he begins his gospel with two very crucial quotations from Malachi and from Isaiah. And these are quotations not just about some vague hope for the future, but something very specific. God is going to come back. Come back? Why had God gone away? Well, in a sense, the Jews believed that he had. Long ago at the time of the Babylonian exile, God had abandoned Jerusalem and the temple to their fate. And the result was that even though they had come back from exile and rebuilt the temple, there was a sense that God hadn't yet actually come back to dwell in this temple, to live there as he'd always intended to. And so Mark starts his gospel by quoting those passages. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, so he's sending his messenger ahead of him. Well, the messenger is John the Baptist. And then Isaiah speaks about getting things ready so that the glory of the Lord can be revealed and all flesh will see it together. And what happens then? We look at the beginning of Mark's gospel and we don't see a blaze of glory. We don't see um, the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire we see Jesus and Mark is saying, read the story of Jesus very carefully because this is what it looks like when God comes back to be king. And it's in learning to do that that we find ourselves launched with Mark into a journey that will take us right the way through Lent and beyond.